and say an official good morning to everyone and a special thank you to Marianne for joining us today and walking us through this next installment of Buy Better Books. Uh, and we are going to be talking this morning about nonfiction. Uh, so Marianne, I turn it over to you to uh, take us through this uh, exciting topic. Thank you, Sam. It's my pleasure to be here with you this morning. Nonfiction is a favorite um, reading choice of mine, so I'm happy to talk about it. This is, as you see on the slide, part two of the State Library's Collection Development Primer, all about collection development. And if I can get my slides to advance, we'll move on here. You can see in the uh, promo that we had for this particular session, part two, that you are sure to leave with, quote, some practical ideas of how to create a well-balanced nonfiction section. And that's exactly what we plan to do this morning. Um, and I just realized I failed to really introduce myself. Sam said my name, Mary Ann Morey, but I am the district consultant for Central District with the State Library of Iowa. So this morning we'll be talking about why you should have nonfiction in your collection at your library, who reads nonfiction, how nonfiction is classified, just how it works, and what you might consider as appropriate titles for those various sections. And then finally, we'll look at some where you can get good ideas uh, for developing nonfiction and some ideas on what titles to actually purchase. As we said, this is part two of a four-part series. If you missed last week's session, that was recorded and will be posted soon to Iowa Learns and to our State Library YouTube channel. And I strongly encourage you to go back and review that session if you missed it, because my colleague Becky Heil did an awesome job of presenting some very basic foundational information about collection development. Um, she was focusing on fiction, but much of what she said about collection development at the beginning of her session, as well as some of the tips she offered toward the end on where to find suggestions for titles, it all carries over to your nonfiction collection as well. So be sure to uh, watch that recording so you can pick up on those foundational concepts about collection development. I'm not going to reiterate what she said because she did such a good job in that, and I'm going to rely on the joys of technology that you can access that recording easily. We also have at the State Library a couple of collection development basics actual courses that you can easily access. The ones that I assume are also on your left, as they are on my slide, come from our endorsement program. And it's all about collection development. Everything you want to know, the basics of collection development are in that course. And you can access those in Iowa Learns or on the State Library's YouTube channel. The other course we have is called Collection Cultivation, and it's all about weeding. For those of you that might be new to library land, weeding is where you're withdrawing, taking out those old, nasty, dirty, torn, or unused, irrelevant titles from your collection to freshen it up. Much as you would weed a garden, you should be weeding your collection regularly. So both of those um, courses are readily available, and I encourage you to watch those for the basics of collection development. I am going to try something brand new today, a poll. Samantha, we will see if this works. I think this is it. I'm going to launch it. Are you seeing this? I oh. do see it. Nicely yeah. done. So when it comes to buying nonfiction titles for my library, I you can only choose one answer. Do you order frequently with confidence? Do you order occasionally whenever you get a patron request? Do you rarely order because none of your patrons read nonfiction? Do you not even bother to add new things because you already have plenty on the shelf that talks about history and facts and those things don't change? Or do you just simply rely on the internet for nonfiction info because, you know, everything's on the internet and you consequently don't even have a nonfiction collection at your library? So we'll leave this up for a few minutes. It looks like people are clicking and maybe changing their minds because the numbers are fluctuating here. We're getting, yeah, we've only, we got about 80% participating and we've got a lot of confident nonfiction orders in the room, which I'm grateful to see. That's good. Yeah, over half of you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people also saying that uh, they order based on patron request, which is, I think, pretty common. Mm-hmm. 
All right. I don't see the numbers fluctuating much anymore. I'm going to go ahead and end this. It looks like we've got almost 60% of you say you order with confidence. So I'm going to kind of test your abilities here as we move into some of these slides, because I'm going to count on you to offer some suggestions, as you'll see in the upcoming slides. That didn't cause anybody to change their answer, did it? Um, <laughs> and then um, we also... Uh, have about a third of you who order as you get patron requests and a few of you who don't order much at all. So that's good to know. Uh, hopefully after this session, you will all be able to say, hey, I can order with confidence. Well, one of the reasons you should be ordering nonfiction is because you likely include a section in your library's collection development policy that talks about nonfiction. I have a screenshot here from West Des Moines Public Library here in Iowa of their nonfiction section from their collection development policy. And you can see that their collection will include uh, titles that provide a core of basic knowledge. And the bullet points there reflect some specific categories, such as contemporary issues, self-help, continuing education, job skills, community affairs, and that would be local, national, and worldwide, different viewpoints on issues, as well as resources that, quote, nourish intellectual, aesthetic, creative, and spiritual growth. So that's a pretty good summary of what to add to your nonfiction collection. Definitely, you want to look at your library's collection development policy to see what it says about the types of nonfiction that you will include. And if your library's collection development policy doesn't include any mention of nonfiction, you may want to fix that. I, before we get too much into this session, I want to talk just briefly about weeding. Uh, we're not here in this session to really talk about weeding. Uh, my colleague Becky addressed it a little bit in the first session of this series. And as I noted earlier on a slide, we have an entire course about weeding. But again, weeding is the process of removing unused, unwanted, tattered, worn copies of books uh, from your collection. I just want to mention this because I have visited a lot of libraries and it seems that in many of our libraries, there's a hesitancy to weed the nonfiction collection. Keep this thought in mind. An old story can still be a great story, but old nonfiction information can often be dangerous if it's outdated or inaccurate. Think about nonfiction titles that may be offering medical, legal, or financial advice, and how, yes, that could be dangerous if you're having old, outdated information on those topics. So thus, your fiction collection can more readily tolerate older titles than your nonfiction collection. And that does not mean I'm advocating old fiction collections by any means. Um, I recall visiting a library uh, one time that had a dreadfully old nonfiction collection. And when I inquired of the director about uh, the last time that any weeding had been done in that section of the library, she told me that her board would not allow her to weed the nonfiction. And this was a new director. And I said, hmm, we need to, to work on that thought a little bit with your board. She also added that nobody checked out much nonfiction. Well, I pulled a couple of books off the shelf, one of which was an old Fodor, Fodor's travel guide from about 10 years previously, as well as a Windows 97 book. They were old, they were tattered, they were grossly outdated. Um, they were just musty, dusty, and I presented them to her. I said, would you want to check these out? Would you value the information you might find in these and find it useful? So I recommended that she take those two books to her next board meeting and tell the board that her consultant had advised a major weeding project in the nonfiction collection. So the moral of the story is, if people at your community, at your library, are not checking out much nonfiction in your collection, take a look at it and see if maybe it just needs to be brought up to date and see if it needs a major weeding project. Um, so you all probably have some nonfiction. I don't think more than maybe one person said, oh, we really don't even have nonfiction at our library. So you probably have some nonfiction. And what you probably have most of in your nonfiction collection 
our cookbooks and biographies. But at the same time, this is kind of the sample that I often see in libraries of what those two sections look like. And keep in mind, these are supposedly the popular sections of your nonfiction. Um, I, I probably wouldn't want to check out these books either. Um, I don't know, Joys of Jello. I know people still eat Jello, but I don't think it's quite <laughs> quite the main course or the featured course as it was back in the 60s or 70s. Um, you probably have a lot of people in your community who would read nonfiction if you simply have newer quality nonfiction titles from which to choose. And a lot of people might actually prefer reading nonfiction. I mentioned earlier that I am one such person and Sam, I think you are as well. I do love a good nonfiction selection. You betcha. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big peruser of the new nonfiction mm -hmm. uh, in libraries I go visit, for sure. Yeah, I read almost exclusively nonfiction. I would say probably 95% of what I read is nonfiction. I'm about 50-50. So, um, so you, you undoubtedly have people in your communities who love nonfiction, but maybe they just don't love your nonfiction collection at your library. So we're going, going to work on that here today. Um, I did a little Googling on this topic of why some people prefer nonfiction. And while your library search stats may show that the majority of your library users prefer fiction, and while your fiction collection is probably larger and may have recently expanded more than your nonfiction section, I think this often uh, lopsidedness is based on the perceived notion that readers just simply won't be interested in nonfiction. I find this very sad because that kind of implies that nonfiction cannot tell a good story, and it can. So some of the concepts in this article, which basically talks about the appeal of nonfiction for many people, include these. Some people uh, don't like the predictability of fiction. Other people who prefer nonfiction like it because they enjoy the accumulation of facts. And people who read nonfiction often like being a student of the world. That's a quote from this article. They just simply appreciate learning. Reddit posted a question, people who read nonfiction exclusively, why, a couple of years ago, and it included some of these comments as, as responses. There's such variety in nonfiction. I'm not interested in character development. I'm interested in topics. I feel I need to be more connected to the real world around me. It's interesting. And finally, many people prefer nonfiction because the old adage is true. Truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, Samantha, I recall one time you said you often read nonfiction because you have read a fiction book on a particular title, uh, a topic rather, or person or point of history, and you want to verify, did this author have the facts? <laughs> That's absolutely right. I go both ways on that. So I just read The Wager by David Gran, which is um, a book about uh, a uh, English uh, ship during the uh, Spanish uh, British War of something or other, and uh, ended up reading a lot of fiction books about boats as well. So yeah, I tend to feed my reading habits both directions. Good. Well, if you're not a nonfiction reader and you struggle to select good nonfiction, or you struggle with reader's advisory regarding nonfiction, or maybe you think you want to try to expand your own reading habits by adding some nonfiction titles to it, then this article is definitely for you. It's written by a librarian from Edwardsville Public Library. And um, it was written in 2019, but it's still very uh, appropriate. The article offers some tips on how to pick a nonfiction book. And I'm just going to quote here from what the author has to say. Uh, the first tip is this, try to think of a novel that you really liked and that intrigued you, a novel that made you stop and think, huh, I wonder if this person or event was portrayed truth truthfully, or I want to learn more about this time period. And that's very much what Sam has said that she has done in the past. Uh, the author of this article also says, try to pick a title that is not over 350 pages so you don't feel overwhelmed, and then adds this. Don't worry, most of those pages in the back are just in notes and bibliographies, so they aren't as long as you might think. 
Um, the author also suggests dipping your toe into nonfiction by starting with a biography, autobiography, or memoir of someone who interests you, or perhaps a time period that interests you. This article I want to mention, um, it, and you can see, fact or fiction, children want their nonfiction books, but adults may be their barriers. Now, we're not here to talk about children's nonfiction. This uh, webinar is about building your adult nonfiction. But the information in this article, which comes from Room to Read, which, by the way, is a very good adult nonfiction title by that same name, Room to Read, um, I, I find it fascinating. As a former youth services librarian, I used to often advise educators and parents, caregivers for their reluctant readers, so-called reluctant readers. Have you tried nonfiction? Because in my experience, both personal and in observation, it seems that adults often try to offer fiction to kids thinking they will like it better. But the reality is there are a lot of kids who will just eat up books about dinosaurs or historical characters or current sports figures or celebrities. Um, I'm the parent of a very reluctant reader. Uh, my older son hated reading. And, you know, how does that grieve somebody who loves books? Um, and it was not until I got him hooked on some biographies of people that dealt with topics he was interested in, that he just became a voracious reader to the point where I had to tell him, it's time for dinner. You need to put your book down. And this kid liked to eat. So that was a major thing. Um, to this day, he is an avid reader, but he always reads nonfiction. So um, I just want you to think about how this concept of so-called reluctant readers may not be because they're reluctant, but it might just be because they haven't yet discovered nonfiction. And I think this fact may be true, not just among kids, but among your adult readers. Okay, so that's kind of the why um, of nonfiction, but I want to move now to um, how the hows of nonfiction. How is nonfiction set up? In most of our public libraries, we still use the Dewey Decimal Classification, or DDC as it's abbreviated. Um, that's how we catalog our books and consequently how we shelve the titles. I think DDC is pretty handy. It breaks down this huge realm of nonfiction into just 10 categories, which you can see on the slide here from the zero hundreds to the nine hundreds. Those are the uh, primary topics of what's included in those sections. And I've kind of offered a few more explanations there in my little boxes to the side. Keep in mind that the five hundreds are natural sciences, things you find in nature, whereas the six hundreds where it says technology, I often call that the applied sciences, where you take things from nature and turn them into something that we use. So for example, you'll find books about wolves in natural sciences, but you'll find books about dogs, domesticated wolf ancestors in the 600s. Um, you'll find information about plants in the 500s, natural, but you'll find books about cooking in the 600s because you're domesticating, if you will, those plants from the wild and turning them into food. Also realize that the 700s, which is uh, titled as the arts, actually include sports. And the 900s, in addition to including history and geography, includes biographies. I have to admit, it was a bit of a culture shock when I moved to Iowa and realized that almost all the public libraries here classified biographies in a different section under B for biography. And that's fine. Uh, where I came from, all of the libraries put biographies in their Dewey number, which is 921. So just realize that biographies technically come under the Dewey category of the 900s. So I want us to take some time today. This is going to form the gist of our session today, thinking about what does Dewey Decimal look like on my shelves? Now, even if your library doesn't use the Dewey Decimal Center, you can still think about this because if you're using a different classification system, it still undoubtedly goes by categories and probably loosely modified on these categories that you see in Dewey. So this information will apply to you even if you're not using Dewey on your shelves. Um, just as an aside, I am not officially a cataloger, although I have done some substitute cataloging and I of course took a 
whole cataloging course in my uh, library school. Um, but I, I borrowed some of these titles that you're going to see. I verified their call numbers from a couple of large libraries, uh, one of which is in Iowa, another which of which is in Indiana, just to make sure that these titles did fall under these actual doing numbers. So here we go. You're going to have to participate in this by typing in the chat. And Sam, I'm going to count on you to help me watch that chat. We're going to start with the zero hundreds. That includes computer science, information, and general works. Take a few minutes here to skim through the 10 subcategories of the zero hundreds and then type in the chat a topic or maybe even a specific title you're aware of that would fall in the zero hundreds. And I have to admit that the zero hundreds are a little bit of an oddity. Sometimes it's not a huge section of a library. Would this be a little more like your like traditional reference section I'm seeing encyclopedias there? Right. Yeah. If you had circulating types of encyclopedias, okay. they, they could fall here. Definitely. Almanacs, uh, Guinness World Records are popping up in some of people's comments here. Dictionary, uh -huh. um, something on artificial intelligence. Um Dictionary so mentions might fall in the 400s, as we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, some of the Four Dummies books have come across here, like iPhone for Dummies or Microsoft for Dummies. Books about coding? Maybe. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Oh, All right. U UFOs and Bigfoots. Oh, yeah. Bigfoot. Good suggestions. I think some of you peeked at my slides somehow <laughs> in advance. So here's some titles I came up with. Um, definitely Guinness Book of World Records. That is always a popular title, not just for kids, but also for adults. The UFOs and paranormal stuff, Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and things like that. Those topics seem to be wildly popular based upon um, what I hear from some libraries that host the paranormal kinds of programs. Books about books will fall under this category. You can see this fairly new title here, The Book at War, um, How Reading Shaped Conflict and Conflict Shaped Reading. And then some of you mentioned the Four Dummies book and technology. So there you see an Apple Watch book um, as one of the, the dummy series. So good job job we had another kind of category of things um like religious books the bible um uh the uh, the mormon encyclopedia would that type of thing fall under here or would Probably that be under not. religion let's oops let's oops went, <laughs> went too far I showed you the answer here. <laughs> Those would probably fall under the 200s, as we'll share in just a minute. Before we get to that, let's look at the 100s. Philosophy, psychology, uh, parapsychology, and occultism. What would be a topic you think would appeal to the general public that might fall in the 100s? Anybody have ideas? Things on witchcraft and witches How are the first two that popped up in the chat here. Mm -hmm. um, neurodivergency, potentially. Um, I worked for a time uh, in a seminary library, and I know we had a lot of 100s and 200s. Uh, so that philosophy mm -hmm. piece we had, we had quite a bit of. Astrology comes, uh, is coming up in chat here. Okay. Dream books. Dream books. Here's some that I found. Uh, ethics is a topic of conversation in a lot of circles now, as is the phrase moral intelligence. And by the way, all of the uh, books that I'm showing on these slides, for the most part, they have been published within the past couple of years. So they're new slash newer, newish titles. So uh, I tried to find some fairly current titles here. Um, general topics about philosophy might go over well so long as it looks new and is not some long leftover from 30 years ago with yellowed pages. Eastern philosophies are quite popular now, as are books about occult metaphysics. Those would all fall into this category as well. 200s. This is a category some of you were alluding to earlier. It's all about religion. And yes, I know the Dewey Decimal System focuses predominantly on the first 10 subcategories on Christianity, but it also has a whole section there for other religions, and you can break those numbers down even further so all of them can be 
um, represented. So what would be some general topics of interest that you might put in the 200s? A lot of people commenting here specifically on different religious texts, Quran, Torah, Bible, mm -hmm. um, Eastern religions. Someone mentions books perhaps about Zen, Christian living. Um, would you tend to see self-help books here or in the previous it, section, it do you think? It will depend on who the author is and what the slant is. If it's a self-help from, for example, a Christian perspective, and there are many, um, it would fall under this category. Um, someone mentions um, books about cults, which I imagine could be a sort of popular uh, title in, in a modern library. Cults are always interesting. Yeah. As I'm watching things scroll through here. Yes, and definitely what makes Dewey confusing to a lot of people for sure. Well, I was this just Someone comments in the chat. This is the challenge that a lot of our catalogers face that okay what what is the aboutness of this book that's really a word aboutness okay it's self-help so boom i'm gonna put it in this oh wait a minute it's got to focus more on on christian self-help so where does it go oh and it's got a cd or a dvd with it so it can become confusing and that's why we recommend that you get your catalog records from a provider and not ever try to do original cataloging yourself. Um, that's probably another whole cataloging uh, class talking about where do you get your records. Uh, yes. That's I think that's included in our endorsement classes about collection development. And you can always contact your district consultant with that kind of question. So back to the 200s here, books about world religions. Two titles that I found that this one on the far right is an older one, Food for the gods, but I thought it was was intriguing. It's about vegetarianism as it is found in various religions. Uh, the sacred art of dying from world religions. And then any of your popular current uh, Christian authors like Lisa Turkhurst and John Mark Comer, their titles are going to be found in the 200s. And so Samantha, we were talking earlier about self-help books. I think John Mark Comer's titles sometimes fall in that category, and he would definitely be found in the 200s. What about the 300s, the social sciences? Uh, when I have taught Dewey Decimal to some groups, I have often said, this is kind of the stuff that you're not sure where to put. It falls in this category. Social sciences include a lot of things here, as you can see on the slide. What types of books do you think the members of your community would find intriguing in this category. Two great subjects popped up right away in the chat, true crime and wedding planning. Both oh, I imagine yeah. are going to fall off, fall off the shelves. Um, yeah. Teacher education. Another thing, um, climate change, climate control is what this says. I don't know if that would fall under um, some more sciencey, but um, but possibly if it's from a political perspective, mm -hmm. it could, um, mm -hmm. you know, like political um, mandates and things like that. Um, holidays and holiday celebrations are something right. that's mentioned. Um, right. Someone well, says here, we have books written by presidential candidates in that section. You all are really good. Here are some that I found, and, and lots of them, because this is such a broad category. Anything about money, finances, investments, retirement preparation, budgeting, those are always popular titles at libraries. And I'm so glad somebody mentioned true crime. That is a great way to introduce some of your mystery readers to nonfiction. Um, books about education, everything from homeschooling to school choice to college applications you'll find here funeral plans because cultural types of uh, customs, etiquette, folklore, those types of things. So you'll find books about funeral, uh, funerary, I think is the word actually, um, traditional costumes, traditional clothing, if you're interested in that. Um, you can see here a title about digital madness actually falls on here because it's all about the social concepts of, of technology. Um, the one book there, What We Remember Will Be Saved. It's a story of refugees and the things they carry. That is found here as is the title about social justice. All of those types of titles and political aspects will be in the 300s. 
Let's try another one here before we take a little break on this. 400s or languages, what will you find here? Sign language was the first thing popped into chat. What a great title. Yeah. Dictionaries. Mm -hmm. And dictionaries for other languages. I'm not sure how many of those are around in our library collection still, but I imagine so. Etymology mm -hmm. mentioned here in the chat. Yeah, great. Yeah, American Sign Language. Those books are always popular. Um, the like the 15 minute Spanish book, those types of books of how to learn a new language would go in this category. But I think those books are kind of dwindling now as more and more libraries are turning to online resources for language development. But somebody mentioned etymology. So any books that would pertain to um, the concepts of language, the construction of language, those would all go in the 400s. Just a little break here. Uh, Moorhead State University, which is located in Kentucky, has a really good, I think, breakdown of the Dewey Decimal Classification System, not just by the 10 major categories, but by the 10 subcategories of each category. And I would encourage you to play around with this website if you are unfamiliar with Dewey or you don't feel extremely confident with Dewey. I have to say, I have taught Dewey Decimal to kids as young as eight years old. And they got it. And they had fun with it because they said, oh, it's like a secret code. And now we know what it means. And they just ran with it. Um, so don't be intimidated by it. It's not that difficult. And with uh, copy cataloging, it's much easier for you to know where to put some of the titles that you may be ordering. Again, uh, see the collection development training sessions for uh, where to get your catalog records. But just realize that Dewey is not that complicated. And with a little training on it, it's pretty easy to maneuver. And as I said, I've taught it to kids as young as eight years old. So I think your patrons can easily learn it. Let's go on to the 500s, natural sciences and mathematics. So as we said earlier, uh, this would be things you find in nature. So think wolves instead of dogs or plants in their natural state instead of cooking those plants. What might you find uh, on your, what would be a good addition to your 500 shelf in your nonfiction section? Uh, we're getting a lot of dinosaurs. Uh, which is uh, maybe a little bit more for the kids' side. I did, however, just read, because I've read so many books to my four-year-old about dinosaurs, I did just read a book about dinosaurs for grown-ups, and it was fabulous. Great. Um, but another one I'm seeing a lot of um, is gardening, uh, which I imagine is a very popular part of this uh, well, section. gardening might actually fall in the 600s. Oh. It's um, you know, domesticating the plants. Aha, this is true. Mushroom foraging, that feels like a bridge one. Yeah, Good, that, probably that's natural science. Possibly. Definitely. Uh, it's about identifying mushrooms, books about identifying wildflowers or, or birds. Mm -hmm. Yep. People have mentioned bird guides here, mm -hmm. which, uh, yes, I imagine quite popular. Birding is having a moment, isn't it? Mm -hmm, definitely. And as spring is has seemingly sprung upon us, I think that's a great book to great section of books to be promoting at your library. Yes, things on trees, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, the ever popular nonfiction author Mary Roach's titles will be found here. And you can see her newest title, Fuzz, there. And if you're not familiar with Mary Roach, she would be a great first nonfiction title to read. All of her books are informative, but also funny, really funny. And I really light, enjoyed Fuzz. Kind of That's a great one for this section. Lighthearted yet very informative and um, just fun to read. So I really recommend her books if you think you want to try to explore some nonfiction. Um, books about animals, again, in the wild. Um, now you can see here 100 plants to feed the birds, but those are natural plants that you could potentially plant in your garden. Things about um, astronomy. We've got this big eclipse that's predicted for next month. So if you've got any books about eclipses, this would be the time to put them out on the shelf and make sure people can uh, take advantage of them. Okay, moving on to the 600s. These are your applied sciences. This is where you take something from nature and, uh, for lack of a better term, domesticate it, turn it into something that we use. What might oh, you, you know what we got first here? Cooking? Cookbooks. <laughs> All yep. right. 
gardening the and pets. Word, the old word in Dewey used to be cookery. Cookery. What a fabulous word. Um, also things like diet, sewing. Uh, we've had a couple people saying mental health. I don't know if that's here or if that's um, in some of those earlier sections. I suppose it's kind of, again, that if it has a religious tone to it, it goes in the 200s. Uh -huh. uh, business management. Canning and preserving. Yes, I'm sure a lot of those go here. Good. Definitely Good cooking. Yep. Yeah. Um, home organization, really still a hot topic. Um, I think Marie Kondo is going to live happily ever after from her joy of cleaning or whatever her book was called, Joy of Organizing, um, the spark joy lady. But organization, home organization, office organization, those are always popular. You can see that the 690s include construction of buildings. That would include things like building a deck. Um, I think, um, oh, my train of thought is horrible. Where you're planting, plotting out where to plant your plants. Can't even think of the word. Goodness. Like the, the raised garden kind of thing. That type of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, landscaping. Call, landscaping, Beth, yes. Beth to the rescue. That, that very difficult word that I couldn't think of there. <laughs> Some days the brain just doesn't function, right? Yes. Um, medical aspects. So, yeah, mental health, physical health, your mental, uh, your um, medical books will all be in the 600s. And then books about cars are often in the 600s because you're taking metal from nature and turning it into a car. So lots and lots of uh, interesting possibilities for the 600s. Moving on to the 700s, this is the arts, but don't let that topic fool you. I gave you a hint earlier, if you were paying attention, maybe you'll have a suggestion for the 700s. Uh, landscaping was our first one to pop up here. I suppose then again, we kind of see how the Dewey system sort of flows from one subject to the other is it's not quite the wild it's a little bit domesticated but yeah. it really is also an art we're seeing lots of music sports um musicians biographies here Same things time. like um photography uh -huh. i'm seeing a few of here um i've got a fishing yep oh we've got so that's correct yeah hiking canoeing fishing came through golf yeah. Television, magic yeah. tricks. That's where I want to go. So here's some samples. That book, Got Your Number, is all about the sports numbers of different characters. Uh, not characters, but sports people and how their numbers affect things. I don't know. It seemed like an interesting title and it was a newer one. Um, painting and the arts. I put the Bob Ross happy little accidents up there. Uh, any books about music that includes cultural music, new music? classical music, books about photography, including books about iPhone photography, your quilting books, any of your do-it-yourself crafting books will come here. And then um, a newer running book there. So exercise kinds of uh, physical fitness types of things are often found in the 700s as well. Any sports related things. And then games too, like rules for how to play rummy or backgammon. You'll find those in the 700s. 800s. This is all about literature and rhetoric. This oh. may not be a huge collection at your library, but you may be surprised at what you might want to consider adding. Any uh, poetry and um, memoirs came through here. Um, essays, literature, satire, plays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So probably an author that is very popular that I, I'm hoping you have at least one book on your shelf, and that's David Sedaris. He has his books typically in the 800s. Mark Twain's witticisms are found in the 800s, as are Shakespeare's plays. Hopefully, uh -huh, yes, someone newer, mentioned Shakespeare, yes. Newer copies of Shakespeare plays, hopefully, not the old musty dusty ones that were around when, when we were all in high school. But <laughs> You know what I was just going to say is this feels like a section where you'd have some classics. Mark Twain, Shakespeare. Quite possibly could, yeah. Um, speeches. So if you have a collected volume of speeches of famous Americans, for example, that would likely go in the 800s. And essays. You can see a title here, The Glorious American Essay. 
and any poetry books, keep in mind we are uh, presenting this session in March, mid-March, but next month, April, is National Poetry Month. So that might be a good time to order a couple of new poetry titles. Absolutely. Our last Dewey section here, the 900s. What might you include in the 900s, which include history and geography? Uh, lots of World War II coming through. So we think, I think we know what, what sells in that section. Someone says all the war books. Yes. I also saw one um, early on travel. Does that go in this section? Travel guides, that yes. sort of type of thing. Geography and travel are the nine. There we go. Um, Iowa history, world history, both coming through. Local history. Uh -huh. Oh, baby names. That's a new one that someone chipped in here. That's interesting. I'd have to think about that one. That I'm. My mind is clicking to the six hundreds, but I could be wrong. I'm not a professional day to day cataloger, but that would be something. Google that one and see what you come up with. Check out some larger libraries to see where they put the baby name books. Yes, now, that's one that hasn't come up yet, though, but I would think would be a pretty popular section and one you'd mm -hmm. want to keep up to date. A book that talks maybe about the history of names for kids might fall here. Again, it all depends on the slant, the aboutness of the book. We did just get uh, someone saying baby names are 929.44. Right. So, yes. Perfect. You. Yep. And someone else confirms that 929.4 heading. Good. So, genealogy is another thing that came up um, yeah. in chat here. And then, if you recall, I mentioned that biographies fall in the 921 section. So, mm. Um, this is a pretty popular section at libraries, as we noted earlier, travel books, local history books, books pertaining to what's going on in the world around us are often found here, like this book about Ukraine, books about the royalty are often popular, and of course, anything pertaining to the uh, the big wars, the Civil War, the uh, World War II, those are always popular and biographies, hopefully biographies newer than the George Burns example that I had on a, uh, an earlier slide. And I'm guessing some of you in the audience aren't even aware of who's George Burns. <laughs> we've got a, we've got a, we can start a fight here in the chat. We've got one person chiming in to say baby names in their library are 649. So we oh. may have... We may have uh, two potential spots for baby names, which is just, uh, I think someone else earlier mentioned the frustration with Dewey. <laughs> uh, that, you know, as long as it's properly cataloged in your library and it makes some sense, uh, it certainly and doesn't have well. to be in one spot, but uh, you do as want as them all in the same it. spot. Yeah, yes, and you can find it back. The purpose of Dewey is findability. Yes. So you're You've got the call number that's in your catalog and it's on the shelf where it's supposed to be and your patrons can find it. I want to mention graphic novels as nonfiction. Unfortunately, the only really good photo I could find of this concept is representing young adult titles. But just realize that graphic novels have a lot more and more nonfiction titles coming out for adults. So um, historical aspects, I've seen books about the great operas in graphic novel form, and they are designed for adults. So keep that in mind. If you don't have any of those in your library, that might be maybe a new section you want to think about at your library and definitely a way to convince people that nonfiction can actually be a lot of fun and interesting. This article was just published this month. It includes nine tried and true nonfiction titles, quote, worth rereading. These are ones that could be good to add to your collection as staples and or to resurrect from your collection for any kind of repeat display, such as our summer reading theme of read, renew, repeat, and more about displays in our next session next week. Some of the titles that you see here on the slide are ones that you might already have in your collection, but just make sure that they are fresh, clean copies because nobody wants to read a tattered, torn, ugly, smelly, dirty book, fiction or nonfiction. Okay, let's whoops, let's talk now about uh, where you can go to get some good recommended titles for your nonfiction collection in our last few minutes here, starting out with the best book awards. And I'm going to just very quickly go through these. The National Book Award is 
uh, has a mission to celebrate the best literature published in the United States to expand its audience and ensure that books have a prominent place in the culture. Submissions open in March and the final winner winners are announced in November. The awards currently honor the best fiction, nonfiction, poetry, translated literature, and young people's literature that are published each year. So the nonfiction winner is probably one that you will definitely want to include in your collection. So watch for that new title, the new National Book Award winner announced in, um, in November, I believe. The National Book Critics Circle Award, they offer several nonfiction awards. In fact, five of their six categories are for nonfiction. They honor outstanding writing and foster a national conversation about reading, criticism, and literature. And their awards are announced later this month in March. Next Generation Indie Book Awards, those are independent authors and publishers worldwide. There are categories in nonfiction as well as fiction. Their awards are announced in June, and this site and the award list is a good way to get some lesser-known authors as well as promote diversity with BIPOC authors, Many because many of the authors are, um, are BIPOC. Uh, the, the Pulitzer Award for Nonfiction, that is by an American author. Um, the winners are announced in May, and from the website they say this, Many, if not most, of the honored books have not been on bestseller lists. So keep that in mind. Um, if you have uh, people who are interested in the title, the topic that wins, you may want to get it. But don't feel like you have to buy the Pulitzer Prize winner um, because it they're often usually um, not on the bestseller lists. Just announced on March 8th, which is International Women's Day, of this year, just announced, is this new Women's Prize uh, for nonfiction. The Women's Prize has been around since 1996, and it previously gave awards solely for fiction titles. But now, as of this year, they have uh, an award for nonfiction. The prize will be awarded annually. It's open to all women writers from across the globe who are published in the UK and writing in English. So the new shortlist has been published. I have it there on the slide. The winners will be announced in June. Here's a new to me resource. It's called Tertulia, I believe is how it's pronounced. And it's, quote, inspired by the informal salons or tertulias of Spanish cafes and bars. It's a new way to discover books through all the lively and enriching conversations they inspire. Tertulia serves up book recommendations and book talk from across social media, podcasts, and the web, all in one app, which incorporates seamless book purchasing. So I like that they have compiled this list of, quote, award-winning nonfiction titles from the previous year. It's very handy. I only had room on the slide to feature a few of the titles, but there were 11 different awards with the winning titles pictured and annotated as well as an option to click and buy. I briefly want to mention the long tail because it definitely applies to libraries. Um, if you remember, I said the Pulitzer Award is often a title that is not on a bestseller seller list. That's part of the long tail. And uh, you can access uh, um, information about the long tail via the internet, so I don't want to go into it too much. But basically, the long tail concept is that the head of your sales, or in libraries, your circulation, comprises 80% of your checkout of only 20% of your materials. My colleague Becky mentioned this 80-20 rule in the first webinar in this series, so watch that recording of our first part uh, to learn more. There's a very long tail to the content that consists of a lot of books that may only get a few checkouts, but with enough of those kinds of books, you can reach a wide audience and see increase in your circulation. In fact, a webinar I watched not too long ago talked about how during the pandemic and thereafter, these long tail titles were increasing for purchases because people have so much more access to learning about what has been published because of the internet. So um, one more poll here. I think I can access it here. Uh, let me see. Uh, you know what, Sam? I think I've lost my my poll process. All right, I'll just ask you the question. Uh, where do you typically go to find recommendations for nonfiction titles? Maybe to vendor recommendations or online searches? 
patrons or you have no idea just type that in the chat and sam if you can help me look at that I actually think I did get the poll started too here for us. Thank you. Um, a lot of people saying online searches. And you can um, pick more than one answer on this poll. Oh, good. So um, where all do you go to find recommendations of nonfiction? Whoa, it's kind of running neck and neck here. It is. <laughs> A lot of um, online searching of other libraries, Amazon, et cetera, and patron requests seem like our two big ones. Things mentions in podcasts is one that came up. And I think uh, there must be someone on staff at um, my main library here who listens to some of the same podcasts I do, or at least watches who they interview. Because I feel like so often I hear an interesting interview with an author on a podcast and uh, the library's got it on order. So I think, oh, yeah. that. That person, that person knows Kirkus Reviews is one that was mentioned in chat, book list, definitely. All right, I'll... Um, so, and I'm so glad some of you were honest and said, hey, I'm in this webinar. <laughs> I want you to give me the idea. So very quickly in our final minutes, that's what I anticipate doing. Oops, stop sharing the poll. There we go. Okay. Um Definitely, you can peruse other libraries, larger library sites, but you have to know which libraries because you don't want to just kind of happenstance. Okay, will this library have something for me? You can waste a lot of time doing that. Seattle Public Library has uh, popular nonfiction books for adults, and they list their most popular nonfiction books for adults, and I believe they maintain this list regularly. Boston Public Library does the same thing. They have what they call Reader's Corner for nonfiction, and you can see in the center of the slide there that they break the nonfiction down into genres, which can really help you fill out those Dewey sections at your library. In our first session, Becky mentioned that you'll want to make sure your collection is diverse, both in content and authors. You can do an online search for, say, BIPOC authors nonfiction or whatever genre you're looking for, and you'll undoubtedly get a variety of lists. This example comes from Shelf Service, which is powered by Bookshop.org, an organization dedicated to helping small local bookstores. Any of your mainstream publishers, such as this example from Random House, Random House Group, will gladly send you regular emails with their newest nonfiction titles. Trust me, they will all be very happy to add you to their mailing lists. Uh, any publisher or similar organization that's in the business of books will provide you with plenty of recommended titles in a variety of genres, including nonfiction. This slide is highlighting book list, which is one of my favorite resources. I just love that book list little um, monthly newsletter slash newspaper slash magazine kind of thing that they publish. A lot of libraries have a subscription to this. It does cost. And they get multiple copies of this little publication that they put on display for the patrons to take. I believe the minimum number you can purchase as a subscription is 50. If that seems like too many for your library, perhaps consider getting a subscription that you share with a neighboring library. And even if you can't get a subscription to the little magazine thing that they publish each month, you can still access their webinars, all of which are free. Many of them are archived as well. And you can get on their mailing list, their email list, that they will send you notification of when those uh, webinars are coming up. And you can get on their Read Alert newsletter, which shares links to book lists, most interesting book reviews and articles that are forthcoming. Libraryreads.org is another great place to learn about new and popular publications in nonfiction and fiction. They have a top 10 monthly titles uh, list that is selected by librarians. So this is by librarians for librarians. In our first installment of the Buy Better Book series, Becky did a live screen sharing of a library book vendor and showed how you can use their websites to learn about print runs, which is the number of anticipated copies that will be produced of that particular title. So that's kind of an indication of the popularity of an item. And again, you can access the recording of this session on our Iowa Learns learning management site or on um, our YouTube channel. Still more tools. Amazon, they have new books, reader reviews. They have the options for if you like this, then you want to read this. 
As I mentioned, every single publisher will have newsletters, emails, webinars. The New York Times bestseller list, they have a combined print and ebook for nonfiction, hardcover nonfiction, and paperback nonfiction, as well as advice and how-to and miscellaneous topics. Um, pay attention to what's happening in the news, what's going on in the world, and that's maybe what you want to get a book about. In the pre-internet days, you could get advanced reader copies, known as ARCs, A-R-Cs, from publishers. These are the earliest, often unedited, not final copies of forthcoming books that you could peruse prior to the official publication. Nowadays, you can get these ARCs as digital copies that you can just download from the companies. NetGalley is one such provider, and for those of you new to library land, a galley is an advanced reader copy. It's not a completely finalized version, but it's close enough to send to readers for promotional purposes. So if you join a source such as NetGalley and it's free to join, you can choose the categories that most interest you. This is a great way to learn about forthcoming titles. Edelweiss is another similar company that provides um, advanced reader copy materials. And again, you can join this for free. And finally, another popular resource is Goodreads. You can see on the slide, there's some nonfiction titles noted that says, um, because Brian liked these titles, then it's recommended that Brian read this new title. So um, there are lots of things you can do on Goodreads, including finding out if a book is a good fit for you, or in this case, for your library. And I need to finish on time because my colleague did that, and <laughs> I don't want to be the run, one to run over time. I just want to again mention that today's presentation is part of a four-part series, and all of these will be recorded. Next week, we are back at it again, and Oops. I hope you will plan to join us. We'll be talking about promoting your collection. So I didn't touch on the topic today as much as I was tempted to talk about how you can make your Dewey collection, your nonfiction collection more accessible to your patrons, but I will be talking about that next week, um, as well as how to make your entire collection, fiction, nonfiction, etc., all more accessible and uh, helping your, your patrons know what you actually have available. So join us again next Tuesday, same time, register in Iowa Learns for part three. And there's my contact information if you have a question about anything I presented today. And Samantha, I think we're making slides as well as all the links to the um, to the different resources I promoted available to everybody, correct? I do have the slides already in Iowa Learns as a attachment, so you can download those from this course. Um, we can work on getting the all the links in one document, and I can post those as well if we've got a handout. I put the link to register for part three in the chat. We'd love to see you next week. I think um, hearing a little bit more about that long tail and promoting the long tail, I'm personally excited about. Uh, you know, you've got all these great things. Women's History Month. Well, let's get some of those biographies um, that might be a little bit older about some truly outstanding women mm -hmm. on the shelf. And let's see if we can get those circulating. So stuff like that, I'm excited to, yeah. to hear yeah. some tips and tricks on, definitely. Um, my thanks to Marianne for uh, joining us today. I've seen a lot of people saying in the chat that they've got all their work cut out for them. And I think that that's true. So um, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, thanks to Marianne again. Thank bye -bye. you. My pleasure. Bye.